Alright, so I went ahead and covered the entire outside with grill tape to give it some extra strength, durability, and to try to block out any light leaks. You can see I added a little extra skirt here on this side of the lid. So that blocks that edge. And then I am gonna probably have to do the same thing all along here. Add a little tab here as a handle. And yeah, just looking through it down here myself, it already looks really dark. The only light that comes in is obviously through here and it's very directional because there's that lip. And so one kind of easy solution that you can do without having to go through all this trouble is you can get a black cloth and whenever you're doing your measurements you just drape that over the body to block out any stray light. Okay so now to mount the diffraction grating and the camera inside of our enclosure. You can definitely mount it like this. I think for me, if we take a look here, it's going to be a bit low. Let's see. Yeah. I mean, it would work, but it would be better if it was raised up about, uh, I don't know, half centimeter to a centimeter. And we can easily do that uh, by making a little stand out of pieces of cardboard or something else. But just for the prototype to kind of test things out, I'm going to go ahead and use the original casing it came in to help me out. And uh, what I'm going to do is go ahead and just put it in just using these two cylindrical pieces. And uh, having the round side of the board here, you, you get the case that has the ridges in there. And normally it sits in here, but I'm going to move it all the way close to center as I possibly can so that the lip here is now above the camera and then the top. Now we just need to put back the screws. Okay so there's the camera inside his housing. I went ahead and trimmed the diffraction grating. First of all the 2x2 two two size I originally came in would have been a bit too large for my cardboard box and this way since there's a flat edge here for the initial stages at least I can line them up just tape on the diffraction grating and that way it'll have something to rest on. Alright so let's give it a shot I got the compact fluorescent light bulb in the fixture here let's try it without any slit so basically in the um, you know, a centimeter wide slit. I'm going to open up the Theramino software. There it is. Here you can select which camera you want to use. So I'm using just the USB plug-in one. Here you can see the actual image that the camera inside the spectrometer is recording. So clearly we're getting diffraction. And because of that wide slit, we're getting these large, chunky bands here. And we can move the spectroscope around, kind of to get different reflections. I don't know if you can see that, but um, these white bands here are reflections off of the inside of the box. So there's probably some light leaks or we could have gone for a better surface on the inside, gone for a matte black. I didn't, I didn't do that. I just used some regular black paint. But also we can change some of the video components here. So we have brightness, contrast, backlight, saturation, hue, sh sharpening of some sort. So we could reduce that down to get rid of that back reflection. We can play around with all sorts of parameters. And basically what we're looking for is a CFL pattern like you see down here on the Theramino site. So there's some characteristic peaks that all fluorescent bulbs have. And um, 
we are trying to find those but you can see right now it's just very broad and no matter what we do really here or how we position the spectrometer it's not going to change that what we need to do is change the slits so let's go for the narrow one that's about I don't know three to four millimeters I'm gonna put that in okay and you can probably see an almost immediate change there though we now got some much well, better defined slits let me just reset that okay yeah that looks a lot better already okay but you guys can probably tell that there's something wrong with this picture here the red is on the left, the blue is on the right. Well, that's not how it should be. So we got this flip box here that we can click. Now it's correct where the blue is corresponding to these low wavelength intensities and the red is corresponding to these higher wavelength intensities. And suddenly you can see we've got somewhat more well-defined peak structure here. It's still nowhere near as sharp as this uh, comparison that I'm looking here at the bottom, but you know, it's kind of getting there. Again, and um, these white reflections, they're gonna count towards the light just the same as the other ones. And you can see this huge hump here at the end. That's not UV from the lamp, that's just uh, artifact and an erroneous component okay so we're already getting there let's also reduce the size of our box here let's see keyboard's not coming up automatically for some reason so I'm gonna go to 15 Oops. And if I go really small to like a five, you can see we've got this really narrow band so I can really select what part I want to measure. But I don't want to go that narrow. Let's try 15, but now we need to obviously move it up. So let's increase this value. All right, so, you know, that's not great, but hey, it's a quantitative results. And we can take a look here and try to match this pattern, since we got some peaks here, to the known compact fluorescent pattern. And this is in fact how you calibrate this instrument. You use the known emission peaks from a fluorescent bulb, and since those emission peaks are based on the emission of chemical elements, they're never gonna change. The different uh, CFL spectra can be different. You can see they've got a couple different ones where this one has this 490 peak. Um, and it kind of changes with uh, different IR emissions. And he has, they have them identified here. And you can also look on the Wikipedia for a compact fluorescent bulb to see what these different peaks belong to. Okay, so we have a button here that's trim scale. So if we hit that, the two characteristic peaks have conveniently been highlighted here for us. And it's gonna be the 546 peak here in the green and the 436 peak down here in the blue. So what we do is if we grab the scale and drag it over, we can adjust the position of these calibration points okay so I think the 546 should be this large peak here in the middle that kind of makes sense to me we got a large number of peaks here and then some more to the red so I think that's these here so the characteristic ones that we used to calibrate is going to be this one so I just grab this axis up here and drag it to match so now you can see the 546 matches with the what the software is identifying as the maximum of this peak 545 but the 436 you can see isn't matching and i'm pretty sure that should be this one here if 
we look down here, the 436 here, and then we have this teal peak in between that and the 546. So I think this is the teal peak that should be at 490. And this one just needs to be adjusted from this direction. And you can kind of go back and forth and try to get that as close as you possibly it's can. as close as I think I'm going to get it. And still, I mean, it's pretty much spot on. The peaks are very broad, but the basic shape the key peaks are definitely there. We're not going to get any better resolution by changing any of the video parameters. What we need to do now is decrease the slit size even further. So I'm going to take out this big one and put in the narrow one made out of razor blades. Let's go ahead and put that in and yeah, now we can face it directly. You can see you get very nice sharp lines. And if you get it that your lines look like this, crooked, what that means is that the orientation of your slit is off relative to the camera and to the diffraction grating. So you can see here, if I change the angle of this, I can fix that or go in the opposite direction. So there you go, nice and straight up and down. And yeah, look how much more resolution we're getting already. This peak is starting to split up into different ones. Okay, there you go. Oh man, look at that. That is really close. If you've ever worked with even laboratory grade set spectroscopes, you know how finicky they are, how everything has to be absolutely perfect. And the more complex you get with the optics, with mirrors and uh, focusing lenses, everything just has to be perfect. In fact, most of, the, most of those setups are put onto shake tables. So basically tables that are isolated from the vibration of the ground. They are so sensitive that, you know, uh, geologic movement can make a big difference. Okay, so let's try to calibrate the sin. We can move our 546 over to the left. And this one just a bit over. The controls here are a bit strange. If you grab the axis or if you grab the yellow box, they do kind of different things. As far as stretching the whole thing or just uh, moving it left to right. You can see the uh, automatically generated maximum point value adjusting. So there we have it 436 to 436, 546 to 546, perfect. So now this is calibrated. And from this point on, we can go on and measure anything else, being confident that the values that we get and the spectrum that we get corresponds to reality. Without this calibration, that is not really possible. You'll still get the characteristic peak positions, but you won't really know where in the visible spectrum they actually lie. This 546 could be 600 something if you don't calibrate it. All right, so here's what I got after some fine tuning and look at how well resolved these lines are. So sharp, so nice. I am truly impressed by what we've been able to do here. Again, huge shout out to Theramino for making this possible. I am all about open source technology, especially when it comes to science. And yeah, look at those lines. I mean, can't get better than that. And guess what? The only thing that I changed was the focus on the camera. Me messing around with it in the beginning when I was unboxing it, get it got it off focus. So I took it out and just... Um, Looking at the image that the camera produced, I focused it in on an object pretty close to it, and boom, it's now working perfectly. You can see even with a high brightness and contrast, we barely get any stray light artifacts at all. We got our calibration points exactly on. We got the Mercury at 546 and the, sorry, and the Mercury at 436, and then 
our terbium at 489 and the reference is 485 to 490 so spot on there and then the europium peak we're at 614 and the reference from theramino here is 611. even been able to resolve these uh, yellow mercury and terbium peaks so doing really well really happy with how this turned out all right guys there you go i'm really excited about this build something so simple took me uh you know better part of a day to build it but it seems to be working accurately and that's just great many more things that i can fine tune lots of stray light reflections that we can get rid of improve the this material inside so we definitely can uh improve on that fix the camera and permanently figure out what exact position is going to work best for us and yeah i really start using it to its full potential what we're doing right now is just observing the spectra of different lights but we can actually use the light in combination with the spectrometer to analyze different materials and that's really what spectrometry is all about is probing into the chemistry of materials using light all right guys thanks for watching definitely let me know in the comments what you think about this build if you have any questions and we'll see you in the next one keep on growing